Hi, welcome to rule of acquisition number 21, the speed distance tell. Basically that means suspect any positive correlation between speed and distance. In other words, the farther you go, the faster you go, the higher you go, the faster you go, things like that. This doesn't include inverse correlations like the, the farther away you are, the slower you go. Those are okay. Okay, this rule of acquisition originated from a question about magnetic fields early on in the days of new electromagnetism. The previous release of this rule of acquisition only applied it to mundane physical phenomenon uh, in order to make it generic and simpler for the average person, but I'm reissuing this now in the context of how it really helped push new electromagnetism along. And so we're going to start with the original question, which I never released it because I didn't really think it was that important, but this actual rule of acquisition came from this next question I'm about to show you. Okay, the original question came from when I was looking at magnetism is, does a magnetic field actually expand and contract like classical theory holds? And to show you what classical theory holds, over here we have a current source which is pushing current into a coil and as you push more and more current into the coil, the intensity of the magnetic field gets larger and we assume that the field is expanding because if there were no current in the coil, the magnetic field would be zero. So it's essentially it's expanding from zero. And that's the way in classical theory we hold that magnetic fields originate. Okay, and likewise when we remove the power source and put a load on it like a light bulb, the, we say in classical theory that the magnetic field collapses back into the coil and supplies the energy back out. So basically it's kind of like a capacitor where say we charge the coil by putting current into it and then we can get that energy back out by applying now that charged coil to a load. And that is the paradigm that classical theorists use when talking about coils. And so the question is, does that really occur? Okay, now again, this uh, expansion contraction analogy is consistent with observation. In other words, it seems to work that way. And therefore, even if I can show you this analogy is wrong, it's still useful. Because then what I'm going to show you is that this analogy contra contradicts other known behaviors of magnetic fields, uh, as well as what will become to be known as the 21st rule of acquisition, which is essentially this presentation. So to simplify the problem, now I originally did this derivation with classical theory, but that's very complicated. So we're going to use new electromagnetism to show. And what we're going to do, we're going to start with a source charge over here, which is traveling at some velocity Vs. And that what we're going to do is compute the force acting on a target charge over here. Okay, so let's consider two ways that a force could be applied to a target charge on the right from the behavior of a source charge on the left. The first way is that if the charge, the target charge, were moving with velocity v toward the source charge, and if the source charge were moving at constant velocity vs, that would be one way to develop a force on the target charge. Okay, so basically what's happening is this charge is creating a magnetic field because of its motion, okay, but this charge couples to that field because it's crashing into it. So it's going from a region of, high, of lower intensity to higher intensity, and that will couple a force in the opposite direction to the direction of this guy's motion. The second method of inducing a force on this charge is if this guy accelerates. If this guy accelerates, then we use the expanding field theory from classical theory and say, now the field is expanding, and therefore now the field is crashing into the charge. And therefore, this charge is sitting in a region from going from lower intensity to higher intensity as that magnetic field expands because his velocity increases. So the question is, can we use do some math to find out how fast that field expands when his velocity accelerates or increases? But first we're going to do the calculations from new electromagnetism for each of the cases and we'll show you how we're going to use those later. So using the second term of new electromagnetism. Okay, and we're just, you know, put Vs in for the source and 
yada, yada, yada. I'm not going to explain this to you. But we end up saying that the force acting down on this charge is this quantity here. Just basically substituting these values into here and dropping all the vector stuff. And we're substituting the sign by saying the force is acting down. So the, this velocity up, this velocity in will cause it to have a force going down. Case two, as the source charge accelerates, okay, and this is how you compute the force acting down. Now what we're going to do is we're going to set the two force downs equal to each other and then solve for the effective velocity of the target. In other words, either the target's moving in or the field's moving out, it should be the same velocity for the same force. Either the velocity of the field or the velocity of the target charge moving into the field should come out to be the same. Okay, so we set them equal and solve, and then what we end up with now is effectively the velocity at the field present at the right charge is going to be the acceleration of the source divided by the velocity of the force times the distance. Now here's where you come into the problem with the 21st rule is now the field at any distance from the source charge, this velocity of this field is going to increase as a function of distance. Even, it, even there's a certain condition where it's going to be going faster than the speed of light, and that's ridiculous. So this can't be correct. This can't be a fact where the distance from the source charge has an effect on the velocity. It's illogical. And so I came up that you can't have any positive correlation between field velocity and distance where the field velocity could exceed the speed of light just based on how far away it is. That's ridiculous. Okay, and again, this became the basis of the 21st rule of acquisition. And, okay, uh, there, there, this, this got all messed up. I was trying to reuse paper from the printer, and it got all fouled up in here. The other problem with this Oh, the other problem with this is let's assume that the source charge was starting from zero velocity before it began to accelerate. Well, at a velocity of zero, you have division by zero here. So that means the field is virtually infinite at the point of origin, the field velocity. That's ridiculous. It doesn't make sense no matter how you try to cut it or how you try to justify it. Oh, and, and another problem with the expanding contracting field is it violates field linearity. We know that light waves, which contain magnetic fields, are able to pass through. These are water waves. I'm just showing you because it just happens also with light waves. But waves, light waves will pass through each other without affecting each other. But according to this model, where you get the energy out of the coil by the field collapsing, well, you know, it's just like a balloon. If I blow up the balloon, the energy is stored in the elasticity of the balloon, and that energy, that force, is coupled to the air molecules inside the balloon. So when I release the nozzle of the balloon, one affects the other and it's able to compress the air and push the air back out. So in order to get the energy back out of a coil in this case, that means magnetic field lines have to affect each other. Magnetic field lines have to apply pressure to one another so that that field can then collapse down and add the energy back to the coil. Well, that means that magnetic field lines affect each other, have pressure on each other. Well, that violates the behavior of light because light passes through each other without affecting it. If magnetic field lines did, in fact, have pressure on each other, then light waves would interfere with each other when they travel. Instead, light waves pass right through each other as if the other one isn't even there. Okay, so the linearity of light says that magnetic field lines do not affect each other. Magnetic fields pass right through each other just like water waves do. I mean, granted, where they intersect, you get positive and destructive interference, but that energy continues on. What we have for present new electromagnetic theory is that magnetic fields travel away from the moving charge or the, the source that creates them at the speed of light relative to the medium and never return. Okay, this is like an optical theory of a magnetic field. And I use this optical theory of a magnetic field to great success with my graduate thesis, where I computed the inductance of inductors by considering all of the charges in the inductor and the field from each little point charge emanates spherically and then goes on forever and ever and never comes back. And with that, you can get excellent, excellent 
agreement with how inductors work and how, uh, how the field says they work and how they're measured in the lab. And so you don't need to have a collapsing field to get your energy back out of an inductor. Okay, so that theory is completely blown away. It's completely unnecessary. It works as if the energy from the charge goes out like light and never comes back. It works just as good. And I even did it for a ground plane. If you put these inductors, you know, if you've got a printed circuit board trace over a ground plane, shown here, it's kind of hard to see in the picture because my printer's on the fritz, is a printed circuit board of a, a rectangular coil inductor over a sheet of copper to give it a ground plane. And all I did there, just like you can see the image in a mirror, the ground plane reflects a negative image of the, uh, the inductor, and that's all I did was com compute as if I had two inductors, one being a negative image of the other, and it came out perfect with regard to experiment. So it was a very successful graduate thesis. Now, let's discuss other phenomenon that the 21st rule of acquisition applies to. And this is where the mundane ones that I put in the original. This is the old Earth-centric model that Galileo pretty much disproved. Now, in the old Earth-centric model, all the stars and the planets and the moon and all the, all the objects revolved around the Earth. Well, that would mean that the farther away you go, the faster those objects would have to be in order that they could maintain, well, especially the stars. Okay, this, this, For the stars to keep all of their positions relative to each other in the night sky, the farther stars have to be rotating faster than the nearer stars. And if they could tell distance back then, they'd say, hey, wait a minute, those stars are very, very far away have to be traveling faster than the speed of light. Something's wrong. So had they had the 21st rule of acquisition in Galileo's day, they probably would have been able to um, get rid of this theory long before Galileo. But they didn't, so they held on to it because they believed what they saw. Hubble's law, which states that galaxies are objects, galaxies in particular that are farther and farther away, travel faster. Here's the relationship. Sorry, it's a bad bitmap. Basically, the distance times the Hubble constant is the velocity of the object. They have a chart for it over here. And again, this violates the 21st rule of acquisition. I don't believe it. I have a better explanation in theoretical mechanics, which is a lot more salient and sane. Pendulum energy, we typically in physics class, we sit there and say, well, we put the kinetic energy at the bottom of the arc of the pendulum and set that equal to the potential energy at the top of the pendulum, and they're able to calculate the velocity at the bottom of the pendulum based on the height. But if you look at this equation, it looks like the higher you go, the faster you go. Okay, there's not a problem with the physics here. What there's a problem is with the mathematical notation. We need another kind of equal sign or some other notation to say, yeah, these are equal, but not at the same time or at the same place. And I kind of come up with this twisted equal sign and, you know, that's, so the 21st rule of acquisition is violated because we have bad notation in mathematics or we need a better description. You know, this is done a lot in physics textbooks, but at least in the context of derivation, it's understood, you know, that they're not the same at the same time and place. Falling into a gravity well. I threw this one in here basically to give an example where the 21st rule of acquisition would not apply just so I can show that it's a tell, it's not an absolute rule. Then I started thinking, so this is a new discovery as of right now, that for the ethereal mechanics, there's no violation of the 21st rule because as you fall, your velocity relative to the ether diminishes. And so we're going to be making uh, rules of motion relative to ethereal mechanics that all bodies will move in such a way to reduce their velocity relative to the ether. Now we have to come up and explain why that happens, but right now we're going we're gonna to start making the rules and those, those natures to kind of supplement ethereal mechanics and have another set of things that we're able to observe. Now if you guys want to run this yourself, I did this in Excel to double check me. And for simplicity, I just set GM equal to 1, so I don't have to put all these complicated constants. And I start the guy falling at 100, 100 units, I guess it would be 100 meters in this case, uh, to a point source that's at 0 and then computed the velocity of the ether at every different point and then computed his acceleration based on the standard gravity model. Okay, and so, and then I just took and divided um, the velocity of the ether at any point divided by his velocity, which you have to do 
uh, basically numerical, numerical integration. Now, maybe I did it wrong, and you guys can check that out, see if you get the same answer I got. That's possible. I am human. I do make mistakes. Sorry, this is stuff from another. So the 21st rule of acquisitions is speed, distance, tell. Suspect any positive correlation between speed and distance, especially if the speed can exceed the speed of light. So again, I don't know if there'll be exceptions for this for ethereal mechanics. Let's see how things work out for now. We're just going to treat this as a tell. And in the rules of acquisition, a tell is something that isn't not necessarily 100% accurate all the time. It's one of those things where it's a hint that you should look deeper at this, make sure it makes sense. That's what a tell is. It's not a rule, it's a tell. So this may end up, if things look out, this may end up becoming an actual more than a tell as things work out. Thank you. Thank you for you folks that are donating. Uh, my website's getting even worse. They upgraded me. My documents, which used to be browsable, are no longer browsable, and I haven't figured out how to turn that back on. And if you guys could donate, I appreciate for those people that are donating. Thank you very much.